team couldn't do without people like you. So this is the best team I've ever been associated with. I have a lot of friends that go back to Houston. My two boys, Bags and Bish. But this team is, you know, National League West. What can I say? These guys are awesome. That was Ken Caminiti in the visitors' locker room of Dodger Stadium after the last game of the 1996 season. The Padres beat the Dodgers in dramatic fashion and won the National League West, and Ken was headed to the playoffs for the first time in his career. But even in that moment, he couldn't help but thinking about Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell, his two closest friends on the Houston Astros. Two years later, Ken would make the World Series for the first and only time of his career, and in that moment, he said he wished nothing more than for Craig and Jeff to eventually experience that themselves. Bagwell and Biggio eventually did make the World Series, in 2005 when the Astros took on the Chicago White Sox in the Fall Classic. As Biggio and Bagwell got ready for their first and only World Series appearance, Ken weighed heavily on their minds. They shared a fraternal bond with each other, a bond which formed over a decade earlier when they formed the young and exciting core of a rebuilding Astros team. I think about Cammy every day, Bagwell told the New York Post at the time of the 2005 World Series. Biggio said the same, while also adding, Cammy was a great man and will always be a great man. That's the part of Cammy people didn't understand. This is Secondary Lead, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti a 10-part series on the life and career of one of the most important baseball players of the 80s and 90s. If you like this show, please click subscribe and leave a rating or a review. And now, Chapter 4, Rebuilding. Following the disappointing fifth-place finish in 1988, Astros general manager Bill Wood had a busy offseason. He relieved Hal Lanier of his duties as manager, and on November 7th, hired 42-year-old Art Howe. Nolan Ryan, about to enter his age 42 season as a player, was allowed to leave via free agency for the Texas Rangers, where he pitched for another five seasons. Mark Portugal and Rick Roden were acquired in trades, and Jim Clancy was signed as a free agent to solidify the pitching staff in Ryan's absence. Wood and Howe tried hard to re-sign third baseman Buddy Bell for the 1989 season, but Bell opted to sign with the Texas Rangers because he didn't want to play on the artificial turf of the Astrodome. Bell was turning 38 in August, and AstroTurf was too tough on his knees. He only wanted to play for a team whose home field was natural grass. After being spurned by Bell, Bill Wood set to work on a trade that could have changed baseball. Boston Red Sox third baseman Wade Boggs had a scandalous offseason. He was sued by his former mistress for $12 million for emotional distress and a breach of oral contract. This created a huge public relations headache for the star, who at that point was a career 356 hitter and had led the American League in batting in four straight seasons. Wood looked to take advantage of the PR disaster, and called Red Sox general manager Lou Gorman with a trade proposal. The Astros offered Red Sox pitcher Bob Nepper and outfielders Kevin Bass and Terry Poole for Boggs. After Boston rejected that offer, Houston revised the deal to be Nepper, Bass, and Ken Caminiti. Gorman rejected the revised trade as well, citing that Boggs was worth more than just that package. Houston's efforts to find a veteran option at third base heading into 1989 tell us a few things. First, it shows a lack of faith that the 26-year-old Caminiti could handle duties as an everyday third baseman. At that point, Ken had only been a 227 career hitter in 93 MLB games with only four home runs and had an on-base plus slugging of 577, about 40% worse than league average. The Astros were willing to give up completely on Ken before he had ever been given a real chance to succeed. Second. It shows that Wood and Howe probably had unrealistic expectations for what the Astros were going to be in 1989. Heading into the season, Howe had high hopes, but his spring training commentary is really nothing more than typical manager speak. He said, we have a very deep and strong pitching staff, one of the best in baseball, and we are a pennant contender. In reality, while Houston began to get younger on the hitting side, the average age of the pitching staff was 33 
and the Astros finished the 1989 season with the fifth highest ERA in the National League, despite playing in the Astrodome, a notorious pitcher-friendly ballpark. Second baseman Bill Doran was coming off of two off-season surgeries and was one of four regulars in the lineup who were significantly below league average at the plate. The 1989 Astros were just not a good team on paper but they overachieved their way to an 86-76 and 76 record, good for third place in the NL West. Upgrading third base in 1989 would not have made them legit contenders. They needed a lot of help, and Buddy Bell or Wade Boggs wasn't going to be the key that put them over the top. After failing in their quest to replace Caminiti at third base heading into 1989, the Astros settled for the man himself. Ken ended up being their most valuable player that season, while making only $120,000. Caminiti played in every game for the Astros except for one and hit 255 with 10 home runs and 72 runs batted in. He led the team with 31 doubles and his RBI and home run totals were second and third on the club respectively. By baseball reference, Ken was worth 4.9 wins above replacement, the most of any Astros player, and cemented himself as one of the top third basemen in the National League. For context, that 4.9 war tied Caminiti with Bobby Bonilla for 11th best overall in the National League, and Howard Johnson of the Mets was the only NL third baseman with a better war. While his offensive output was around league average, most of Ken's value came on the defensive end. Defensive metrics are particularly unreliable in the period before StatCast came into use in 2014. Total zone is the only real advanced defensive metric from the 80s and 90s and should be used sparingly, if at all. That being said, Caminiti's total zone runs above average rating of plus 23 for 1989 was the best among National League third basemen. Terry Pendleton of the St. Louis Cardinals finished second with 19 and Matt Williams of the San Francisco Giants had 12. Those were the only three third basemen in the NL who were rated better than plus eight for the season. The eye test confirmed what the numbers said. Caminiti was without a doubt one of the top defensive third basemen in all of baseball. Mark Sweeney was a teammate of Caminiti's with the San Diego Padres in 1997 and 1998. Ken Caminiti describing the way he played, he played with an intensity, he gave you an attitude that was something that you had to have as a club. Was he a conventional third baseman? Was it everything sound uh, fundamentally? No, he had a cannon of an arm. He was always on the ground. If you looked at pop-ups, I laugh now thinking about it, but my vision of him is seeing a pop-up and he's he's sprawling, like he's catching a, a pop-up and he's falling and, and rolling on the ground. And we'd give him a little razzing when he came into the locker room. But he was, he was one of those guys that uh, that's exactly how he played. Um, mm -hmm. It was cool to watch him when he was healthy, when he was playing at a high caliber you realized that he was gonna change the game that night. He had that it factor, and I thought it was really cool. Finally, a full-time starter in Major League Baseball, Ken performed well and proved to the Astros that he belonged. But after another season of missing the playoffs, Bill Wood began a full-on rebuild heading into 1990. Kevin Bass and Rick Roden were granted free agency, and beside a few bench players and middle relievers, there was no real attempt to upgrade the team. Houston had a crop of talented youngsters progressing through the minor league system and seemed content to let those players develop. The first wave of these players hit the majors full-time in 1989, led by catcher Craig Biggio. Long before he was a baseball Hall of Famer with over 3,000 hits, Biggio was a first-round pick of the Houston Astros in the 1987 MLB Draft. Taken 22nd overall out of Seton Hall University, Biggio broke into the major leagues as a catcher, before moving to the outfield and second base for the rest of his career. Two years younger than Caminiti, the pair hit it off almost immediately. In what seems like an odd move for two city guys, Caminiti from San Jose and Biggio from Smithtown, New York, just minutes from New York City on Long Island, the pair leased a hunting ranch together in South Texas. They called it Cambo, a portmanteau of their last names, and although the venture didn't last long, Biggio eventually bought a ranch of his own in Sabinal, Texas. When Craig asked his family if they wanted to change the name, they said no. The Biggios still own Cambo Ranch to this day. Biggio, like many others in the Houston organization, knew well about Caminiti's problems with alcohol. As their careers progressed together with the Astros in the late 80s and into the 90s, 
Biggio would arrange to live in the same housing complex as Ken to keep an eye on him. He would check in the parking lot before going to bed and look for Caminiti's car. If it wasn't there, he knew where Ken was. People ask me what kind of person Ken was. Biggio told the Houston Chronicle in 2007, shortly after collecting his 3,000th career hit. Everyone knows what kind of player he was. He was a warrior. He played in any kind of pain. He had an obligation to the people who depended on him. He was the guy you'd want in your foxhole, and he was a great guy too. He was one of those people that would have given you the last dollar he had. If you needed something, he'd be there for you, no questions asked. I always said that if I was in trouble and had one telephone call, he'd be the one I'd want to call. Biggio did get into trouble on June 8, 1989, and it was alongside Ken Caminiti. Celebrating a win over the San Diego Padres on June 7th, Biggio and Caminiti each drank a post-game beer in the Astros clubhouse. The pair then went to a nightclub in Houston where they had at least three more, and then another nightclub where they each had one more. When he needed a beer, I handed him one, Caminiti testified. I didn't even bother to ask him if he wanted one. At 2.15 a.m., two Houston police officers saw Biggio sports car driving 50 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone as the players headed home. They said the car was weaving and almost struck a curb. A breath analysis test showed Biggio's blood alcohol level to be 0.13, above the 0.10 legal limit in Texas at the time. Caminiti admitted that he was too drunk to drive at the time, but thought that Biggio was perfectly functional. Officer R. E. Myers said the car, quote, almost went over the sidewalk. Officer Joel Garza testified that when he approached the car, Biggio handed over his driver's license and two $100 bills, which he believed to be a bribe. He was arrested for DWI and fined by the Astros. Biggio was found guilty and offered a sincere apology for the event. As Biggio and Caminiti's relationship was budding, Major League Baseball and the Players Union were about to butt heads again. The collective bargaining agreement signed following the two-day 1985 strike ended on December 31, 1989. Having learned nothing from the strikes in 1981 or 1985, baseball owners wanted the players to agree to a salary cap and sought to overhaul the arbitration system. The MLBPA refused to agree to any deal which involved any kind of salary cap. By early February, the owners publicly made it clear that they would lock out the players if a new CBA couldn't be reached by the start of spring training. Union Chief Donald Fear claimed that this was always the owners' intentions, citing lockout language that started appearing in contracts in the previous two years. On February 13, 1990, the lockout began. New Commissioner Fate Vincent was active in the negotiations with the union and was frank with them. The lockout continued for 32 days before a deal was reached on a new CBA that was set to last until the end of 1993. Many players felt that the owners were willing to let the lockout stretch on until they could break the union, but luckily, it didn't come to that. Players won an increase in the minimum salary from $68,000 to $100,000 and saw a massive increase in MLB's benefit plan contribution, from $34 million to $55 million per year. To win this and get back to work, players accepted some concessions on arbitration, but not the complete overhaul that owners originally wanted. The MLB season got underway a week late, and no games were missed. Perhaps most importantly, Vincent and Fear developed a strong relationship and respect for each other throughout the process. Vincent was a refreshing change for Fear, who said commissioners have a history of presenting themselves as something they're not. He made no pretense of who he represented, in addition to the fans and the best interest and all that. Yes, I do like him. Owners, however, were less enthused with Vincent's performance, and discontent brewed among a group led by Milwaukee Brewers owner Bud Selig. They felt Vincent went behind their backs in negotiations to bring an end to the lockout, as the owners wanted to hold out longer to get what they desired. Another important development in the 1990 CBA allowed the National League to expand by two teams, so they would have 14 franchises to match the American League's 14. After being talked about through the late 80s, baseball would grow by two teams, and in 1991, Miami and Denver were granted MLB franchises for 1993. 
Years later, Vincent admitted that expansion was largely a way for MLB to raise more money to pay off the $280 million judgments from collusions 1, 2, and 3. But for now, it also led to divisional realignments, the invention of the wild card, and helped fuel part of the offensive explosion of the 1990s. When play finally began in 1990, neither the Houston Astros nor Ken Caminiti had a good year. The Astros skittered to a 75-87 and finish, good for fourth place in the NL West. The team finished dead last in the NL in runs scored, and was only 12 games under 500 because the pitching staff was around league average. While Ken's batting average didn't drop much, from 255 to 242, his production in nearly every other category fell off the table. He had only 20 doubles, 4 home runs, and 51 RBIs. His war was negative 0.2, which made him the 382nd most valuable player in the National League. He was plus 2 in total zone runs above average, a big drop from the previous year, but fielding stats are fickle, and that doesn't mean that he all of a sudden got worse in the field. Chris Donalds remembers his defensive abilities. All of a sudden, the ball would be hit down the line, and he'd like this diving cartwheel thing comes up and throws a guy out by like 10 feet. I just like I would just sit there and shake my head, like, how do you how do you do that? Any ball that went up in the air, he was going to get. You know, sometimes it's the cost of banging himself up on plays that probably shouldn't. You know, a more conservative guy would have been looking out for long term health, where that that never I don't never entered into his mind. I mean, if it was a play that could have been made, he was going to go try to make it. Bright spots for the Astros were Franklin Stubbs, who led the team with 23 home runs, and Mark Portugal, who settled in as a solid rotation piece. But the most important day of the season came on August 30th, when Bill Wood made a trade with the Boston Red Sox. The Sox had spent much of August in first place in the AL East, and were looking to fend off the hard-charging Toronto Blue Jays. Lou Gorman knew his team needed bullpen help to seal the deal, so he called up Wood and swung a trade to acquire Larry Anderson. A journeyman early in his career, Anderson had established himself as one of baseball's best relievers in Houston. At age 37 in 1990, he had a 1.95 ERA in 73 and two-thirds innings with the Astros, and he posted a 1.23 mark in 22 innings with Boston after the trade. Anderson was a big reason why the Red Sox won the 1990 AL East. Despite that, history will forever remember this as one of the most lopsided trades in baseball history, as Anderson left as a free agent after the season and the player the Astros acquired would go on to a Hall of Fame career. Jeff Bagwell was 22 years old at the time of the trade and had been tearing up the AA Eastern League as a member of the New Britain Red Sox. He put himself on the prospect map by hitting 333 with 34 doubles, but his acquisition presented a challenge for Caminiti. Bagwell was a third baseman. The Red Sox deemed Bagwell expendable because he was blocked in the major leagues by Wade Boggs at third base. After sticking around for two full seasons as the Astros' third baseman, Caminiti once again had competition. A scouting report on file at the Baseball Hall of Fame might provide insight as to why Houston was constantly looking to trade or replace Caminiti and why there were no takers. Filed by scout Larry Monroe of the Chicago White Sox on July 28, 1990, the report notes Ken as a tough player and credits him for being a switch hitter with bat speed and arm strength. However, Monroe notes that he doesn't think he could help the White Sox or that they should acquire him. In summary, he says, has tools but hasn't developed. Couldn't take now. Losing player. Scouting opinions can be subjective, and we don't know if Monroe's assessment of Caminiti was an outlier or the norm around baseball, but it at least provides insight as to what teams were thinking about Caminiti at that point in his career. Rather than trade Ken, Wood held on to his third baseman as he continued to offload veteran players in favor of younger players with more potential. He allowed a half dozen players to leave via free agency at the end of the season, and on January 10, 1991, swung a massively lopsided trade with the Baltimore Orioles, which was the height of the Astros' rebuilding efforts. About to enter his age 30 season, first baseman Glenn Davis was traded to Baltimore for a package of center fielder Steve Finley and right-handed pitchers Pete Harnish and Kurt Schilling. Davis struggled with injuries in three years in Baltimore before retiring. While Steve Finley went on to become one of the best overall center fielders of his era, 
Pete Harnish anchored the Astros' rotation for the next several years, and Kurt Schilling was traded after one season before he turned into one of the most feared pitchers in baseball. The Davis and Bagwell trades were both master strokes by Wood and set the Astros up for a run of success in the 1990s, which continued well into the 21st century. There was another big factor at play in the dismantling and rebuilding of the Astros as well, money. Astros owner John McMullen purchased a 33% stake in the franchise in 1979 for $19 million. He eventually bought control of the team from the Ford Motor Credit Company and became the primary owner. By the time the early 90s rolled around, McMullen was ready to sell the team and wanted to shed high-priced players to make the franchise more profitable and attractive to potential buyers. Murray Chass of the New York Times had a point though when he asked, how many buyers, however, would find a team devoid of name players attractive. Heading into 1991, Ken Caminiti was one of the highest paid members on the team, settling in arbitration for $685,000. Heading into the 1991 season, the Astros' nucleus was young, and 14 of the 27 players on the 1990 opening day roster were gone. Caminiti, now 28, was one of the elder statesmen on the team, with only 30-year-old Casey Candell being his senior among starting players. Art Howe asked Caminiti and the 25-year-old Biggio to step up and be leaders in the clubhouse. The average age of the 1991 Houston Astros was only 26 years old, and they had tremendous potential for the future. Biggio, Bagwell, Caminiti, and Finley were joined in the lineup by 23-year-old Luis Gonzalez in left field, and rookie Kenny Lofton made his Major League debut that year as well. On the pitching side, Pete Harnish was selected as a National League All-Star, Darryl Kyle made his Major League debut, and Kurt Schilling was solid out of the bullpen. Despite this collection of young talent, which would combine for dozens of All-Star game appearances, two MVPs, and had two future Hall of Famers, the Astros were terrible. They finished last in the six-team NL West with a record of 64-97, and 29 games behind the first place Atlanta Braves and nine games behind Cincinnati for fifth. They had the worst record in the National League and the second worst record in all of baseball. Owner John McMullen, though, was pleased. The team turned its biggest profit ever in his ownership in 1991. The 91 Astros were the worst team that Caminiti ever played on. But before the season got underway, he had to fight for his job in spring training. Even though Houston was constantly toying with the idea of trading Caminiti or bringing in another third baseman, this was the first time since 1988 that he entered spring training competing for his job. But the one thing that, that Ken had that uh, is sometimes lacking is uh, he did have a lot of humility. He, he was a pretty humble guy. That humility remembered by Dana Corey was on display during spring training 1991. When asked about Bagwell, Ken said, Jeff is a fine player and a great addition to our ball club. As far as I'm concerned, if Jeff is going to make us a stronger team, I'm all for him being here. Caminiti spent the offseason working on his swing and was tearing the cover off the ball in early spring exhibition games. Even so, you don't often see a veteran speak like that about a rookie who is challenging him for his job. But it gives insight into the relationship that the two were already forming at the time. As the Orlando Sentinel put it, Caminiti and Bagwell aren't bosom buddies, but rarely do two guys competing for the same job become as close as they have. They worked out together and bonded over their shared desire for the team to be successful. Their friendship blossomed over the next four seasons as Cami, Bagwell, and Craig Biggio forged an eternal bond not only as teammates, but as friends. Chris Donalds describes them as a band of brothers who first bonded over their young families and shared competitive spirit. The bond between Caminiti and Bagwell had one other important element. They both faced similar demons. In October 2020, 15 years after his Hall of Fame career finished, Jeff Bagwell publicly talked about struggles with alcoholism for the first time. Bagwell has been sober since 2017 and helps kids at Archway Academy, a sober high school in Houston. Art Howe reiterated in spring training that Caminiti was the man to beat in the competition and said, I think Cami has done everything possible to come back strong this year. He's developed into a solid fielder 
and if he can put it together as a hitter, I think he'll have the kind of season he had in 1989, if not better. Ken won the starting third base job, and Bagwell was transitioned across the diamond to play first base. Jeff Bagwell played in over 2,000 career games and never logged a single inning at third base. With the starting third base job solidified, Ken made Howe's prediction come true in 1991 by returning to his 89 form. His batting average bounced back to 253, and he set career highs in home runs with 13 and RBIs with 80, both good for second on the team behind Bagwell, who took home NL Rookie of the Year. Caminiti led the team with 30 doubles and defensively was rated by Total Zone as the third best third baseman in the NL, behind Pendleton and Matt Williams. Probably more important to Ken than anything he did on the field in 1991 came in June, when he and his wife Nancy welcomed their first daughter into the world. The couple would have three daughters in total, who collectively were the most important thing in Ken's life. After the 1991 season, Bill Wood's touch with trade seemed to falter. Looking to bolster the young core to begin competing, he traded Kenny Lofton and Dave Rode to Cleveland for reliever Willie Blair and catcher Eddie Taubensey. Kurt Schilling was shipped to Philadelphia for Jason Grimsley at the end of spring training. Adding Taubensey behind the plate helped the team by opening the door for Craig Biggio to move to second base, where the wear and tear on his body would be less, but Lofton and Schilling both blossomed into stars in their new homes. Ken went to arbitration with the Astros and settled for $1.5 million, making him the second highest paid player on the team in 1992, and he produced like it. That year was when it finally came together for Caminiti at the plate. He hit 294 and saw his strikeout numbers decline. He hit 31 doubles and matched his home run total of 13 from the previous year. Offensively, the Astros improved in 1992, finishing close to middle of the pack, but the pitching staff was problematic. Injuries and ineffectiveness plagued the staff, and the offense was good enough to help the team to an 81-81 and finish, fourth place in the NL West. It was a 16-win improvement from 1991, but despite that, the team sunk to dead last in the National League in total attendance. We're back at the Astrodome in Houston, Texas, the site of the Republican National Convention, the concluding night. The climactic moment is about to be with us. That is the appearance here of President Bush in the speech that even his friends and neighbors are now describing the most important speech of his political life. There were many reasons for Houston fans to be upset at owner John McMullen, not the least of which was that he rented out the Astrodome in 1992 to host the Republican National Convention in early August. As a result, the team had the longest road trip in baseball in nearly 50 years, 26 games in 28 days, all of them on the road. Houstonians were angry with McMullen's apparent prioritization of profits over winning, and those with knowledge say that he really did not care if the long road trip hurt the team on the field. He was already engaged in talks to sell the Astros at the start of 1992, so he knew his days were numbered anyway. Art Howe said of the trip, it was a turning point for our organization. The Astros departed Houston at 6 p.m. on July 26, 1992, and returned at 8.35 p.m. on August 23rd. They traveled 9,186 miles by plane and bus in 28 days, with only two off days. They were the youngest team in baseball, had the lowest payroll in baseball, and the promising core hadn't yet learned to win on the road going 13 and 27 in their previous 40 away games. But that all changed during the swing. The young laid back Art Howe let plain hijinks slide as players pulled endless pranks on each other. They milked cows on farmers night in Cincinnati, endured the Landers earthquake in Los Angeles, and dealt with Pete Harnish turning an inflatable sex doll purchased in San Francisco into a team mascot. Caminiti started the trip well and had his season batting average up to 317 on August 5th. This is the best groove I've ever been in in my life, he told the Houston Chronicle before divulging some superstition. He mentioned he didn't wash his socks or his undergarments whenever he got hits. After that quote, he went one for 15 in the next series and hit just 145 for the remainder of the trip. Hopefully, that led to some clean laundry. The Astros won 12 games and lost 14 during the trip, 
which was far better than anyone expected. They used that momentum to finish the season on a 25-13 run to get to 500 on the year. More important, that trip brought the team together and laid the foundation for success in the coming years. Caminiti's stellar offensive numbers in 1992 would have been a lot better if he hadn't missed three weeks in April and May while recovering from an injury. Two days before his 29th birthday, in a game against the San Diego Padres at the Astrodome, Caminiti separated his right shoulder and landed on the disabled list for the first time in his career. Already having undergone two knee surgeries by the time he made his MLB debut and still feeling the effects of his shoulder injury in college, Houston might have taken this as a warning sign that Ken's hard living on and off the field might be taking a toll on his body. When he was healthy, Cammy, Biggio, Bagwell, and Steve Finley gave the Astros as good a top of the order as any team in the National League. Yet as both Caminiti and the Astros were trending in the right direction, trade rumors popped up again in the offseason of 1992, with the Houston Chronicle speculating that he could be part of a major offseason trade. But there were no major moves made by the Astros after the season via trade. Bill Wood improved the Astros through the free agent market, signing Doug Drabeck and Greg Swindell to bolster the starting rotation. He also agreed to three-year contract extensions with Biggio, Finley, and Caminiti. Ken's new contract was worth over $10 million in the next three years, a long cry from when he borrowed money from his parents in the minor leagues. However, the writing was on the wall that Caminiti's time in Houston might be coming to a close. By virtue of having the worst record in the NL in 1991, the Astros had the number one overall draft choice in the 1992 MLB draft. There was a lot of pre-draft buzz about a shortstop from Kalamazoo Central High School in Michigan named Derek Jeter, but Bill Wood and scouting director Dan O'Brien instead selected Phil Nevin, a third baseman out of Cal State Fullerton. Andujar Cedeno was one of the top five prospects in all of baseball, and Bill Wood seemed determined that he was the future at shortstop for the Astros. It didn't hurt that Phil Nevin cost $300,000 less to sign than Derek Jeter would. Astro scout Hal Neuhauser was lobbying the organization hard to select Jeter anyway, and he ended up quitting his job and retiring early after Houston passed. The selection of Nevin hurt Caminiti, who wondered why the Astros would select a third baseman first overall. Chalk that up to another in a list of growing instances where Cami felt spurned by the Astros. A long-term Bagwell, Biggio, Caminiti, and Jeter infield in Houston was not meant to be. On the next episode of Secondary Lead, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti. The years-long labor strife between players and owners reaches a breaking point, and Major League Baseball players go on strike. The Astros finally trade Ken in one of the biggest deals in baseball history, and a new teammate changes everything. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and leave a rating or a review, and spread the word by telling a friend. Follow us at Secondary Lead on Twitter and Instagram, like our Facebook page, and check out show extras on YouTube. Music is courtesy of PurplePlanet.com and the YouTube Audio Library. Our theme was written and performed by Jim Montgomery and Chris Cottrell. I'm your host, Joe Vasile. Thanks for listening. <laughs>